I think it's important to always have context and try and understand things from other perspectives, uh, even if that other perspective may be quite out there or there may be a lot of opposing facts that are connected to another person's reality. But the only way you're going to understand that other person's reality is if you take a listen to what some of those facts are. Uh, and sometimes it may even lead you to change an opinion. I'm not saying that my opinion is changing on what we're about to talk about. Uh, but it is some interesting pieces that the defense of Brian Koberger uh, have been bringing up. It's uh, also having a lot to do with that 37-day stay, which uh, we're now up to... A little bit more than about, uh, well, literally, we are about uh, two weeks out from that stay being up uh, in the uh, proceedings against uh, Brian Koberger. But uh, this is some some odd things that uh, we've learned uh, about in some of the filings that uh, Koberger's defense uh, has been uh, bringing to light. Uh, new court filings trickling in. Uh, and showing some of the complexities and potential cracks in the prosecution's case against Coburg. I'm just saying, have an open mind uh, on this. I had an open mind on it, too. I still stuck with my original opinion at the end of it. But I think it's interesting to look at this. Primary shocker in the saga is the presence of DNA evidence from three different men at the murder scene. Did you know that there was DNA from three different men at the murder scene, Stacey? I did not. This is absolutely new information. But, I mean, this is my argument, and this is it was a party house. Where was the other DNA found? That's not necessarily really brought up here a whole lot. Uh, the revelation is made by defense attorney Jay Weston uh, Lodston uh, in an objection to the state's motion for a protective order. Lodston brought this to the forefront, stating that the investigators discovered DNA from two men inside the house, and a third outside, all contained uh, on a glove. However, none of this DNA belonged to Koberger. Moreover, Logston points out that the investigators never ran these samples through the combined DNA index system, CODIS, to find a potential match, which uh, this seems a little odd. Uh, why, if you found this DNA, why would you not at least take a, a shot at it? And I, I talked to... Uh, an individual that we're going to be having on the show here later in the week, Dan Crane, uh, about that uh, earlier today. Uh, and he's got some very interesting theories on it. Uh, one of them being they already had a pretty good match and they already had something pretty solid going and connecting dots that way that maybe they didn't want to get anything else into the ecosystem here as added noise where just because there's DNA somewhere doesn't mean it's necessarily that of a killer. Like I said, it was a party house. There was a lot of people coming and going. It was winter. Uh, if you go for a walk in winter in a uh, cold climate, mm -hmm. I can guarantee you're going to find a glove somewhere on that walk laying in the snow. Uh, people drop them all the time. <coughs> now that glove never connected to the actual murder whatsoever. But uh, it, it is it is interesting that we're just kind of now learning about that aspect of it and and why they didn't run it. That that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the the key piece of DNA that was found uh, in the scene was on the knife sheath. Sheath. The defense spearheaded by Koberger and his lawyer vehemently sought a detailed account of the use of genetic genealogy. Remember, this is how they connected uh, Koberger's uh, father to him and to that knife sheath. This technique deployed by the FBI was instrumental in initially identifying Koberger as the person of interest in the case. The state, however, has dismissed these results. They argue that the match between the DNA found on the knife sheath at the crime scene and the DNA from the buccal swab provided by Koberger renders the genetic genealogy irrelevant to the trial, thereby ignoring its potential role in establishing the suspect's innocence or guilt. I don't quite so, understand that whole sentence. <laughs> but so what what's happening here is they're going to put doubt in the jury's mind. That's they, what they're trying they, to do now. This is exactly what this is. It's a very pointed way for the defense to say, eh, here's something for you to think about. Mm -hmm. And so a juror 
which by the way, I just got a jury summon. So I'm paying very close attention to this stuff. Um, they're going to be sitting there going, you know, what about this? And they may say to themselves, we think he's guilty, but then there's this one little nagging doubt that just got thrown out there. And that, and that's the problem with, this is the problem with juries. Uh, yes. Uh, they're basically trying to prime a jury with doubts. They have no idea who this jury is going to be yet. So it's right now the general public and whoever might end up being in it from Moscow. Uh, but, what they're they're trying to do is is sow those little seeds of doubt. But the problem is, you can have those sort of doubts, but you can't have your own facts. Uh, yes, is there a chance of like one in quadrillion that uh, it's the wrong person? Sure, there's not quadrillion people on this planet, uh, so uh, that 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 kind of poses a problem there. Uh, but if one says there's a chance, even like into the thousands. Uh, I Dan was saying that even when it's in the thousands, like one in 10,000 juries still have sometimes a hard time saying without a reasonable doubt that this is the person. However, that is the definition of not a reasonable doubt. One in 10,000 or something that that's not reasonable uh, to mm-hmm. assume that, that you just happened to hit the lottery on this one person. So, well, and one thing that somebody very close to me who is an attorney uh, mentioned to me when I kind of pissed and moaned about getting a jury summons. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, this was in a text that he sent to me. Uh, I, he said, the question for a juror is, can you be objective and do the job based on the evidence? Everybody has their bias, but can you do the job based on the evidence presented? Okay. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know. Everybody does have a bias. And with all of the coverage that's out there, including what we're doing, can somebody go in and put aside their bias and look at the evidence presented and and be fair? I don't know that anybody can. We all have our opinions on this case, don't we? Oh, sure. We do. I mean, and and, I mean, but uh, I think a lot of people base their opinions on fact and on hard evidence. If we didn't have a lot of hard evidence in this case, I think there would be a lot more doubt. But there, I mean, there already is doubt from a lot of people, uh, which I don't quite honestly understand because uh, I never really hear a really good, solid answer when I ask that question. Like, OK, cool. But why? What? Why don't you think? Well, and then it's usually brought up something where they've misunderstood something or misunderstood some piece of evidence and how it works and how it's checked and how it's identified and confirmed. And there's usually some sort of error in that way of thinking. And yeah, and, and I, you know, I like to know if there's something that I'm thinking incorrectly or that uh, I'm basing an opinion on a incorrect uh, what I'm viewing as a fact. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't like the idea of being wrong. Uh, But if you're objective and can accept that sort of thing, then, yeah, I think you can be impartial. But if you're like 90 some percent of the population that digs in and does not want to be wrong once they think they know the answer to something, despite new evidence or despite facts Mm -hmm. or despite things changing that you may not have understood at the time correctly, uh, then you have problems, uh, which is is why we have you know i think the issues that we do uh, i don't even know tony if i could be you know let's just say obviously i would never be pulled into this jury pool i'm not in the area mm-hmm. but i don't think i could be impartial i i think i've i've seen the evidence that i've seen and i form my opinion and i'm not sure anything could sway me otherwise and and that's like you said that's that's what's going on with our society people like you said I don't I don't know if it's an accurate stat, but ninety percent I yeah I'd go with that. Ninety mm-hmm. percent of people have their beliefs. That's why we are in such a political climate because people have their belief and they're not changing. They yeah. they think they've seen things. They think they have the evidence, and by God, your your view isn't going to change me. So I I think we are so stuck in our ways, and we dig our heels in when we say I'm right. You can't change my mind. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very difficult and crazy world out there with that sort of stuff. And, and and what unfortunately we see ruling everything is the extremes on both sides. Yeah. And and then them demanding that whatever side you kind of sway more to, you better be 100% on this side or you are a 
insert whatever derogatory thing they want to call you if you don't one hundred percent agree with their opinion. Uh, yep. And it's, and it's a both sides issue. It is. It's one hundred percent. Yeah. In in any scenario, it's not just political. It's it has to do with life and death. It has to do with so many other things. It's it's all over the board. We are a very um, black and white society, and I don't mean in race. We are, it's either this way or it's that way, and it's nothing in the middle. We're completely polarized. Um, Absolutely. With the way that that all of that is. And I, I think it, it, it then, it doesn't just mean politics. It means anything, any way of thinking. Uh, and, and if someone's really dug into something, and even though, you know, I, I like facts. I like to show people facts. I Like I said, I like to learn facts, too. I'm cool with being wrong. That's how you grow. That's how you learn. But uh, not so much the case with a lot of people. And if you can't respond to facts appropriately, meaning take it in and understand that it's not a lie and it's not just something you can shove off and go, well, that's a conspiracy theory. Well, no, it's it's not. Mm, no, uh, it's, or not. it's like here. This is literally what happened. Here's the video. Here's them saying this. Here's the you know, just like indisputable uh, questions about things. But people will still they like to stay in their world of being right and we are now entering a new uh, complex place in life where ai will be very much a part of our lives and Mm -hmm. be able to reproduce uh audio video uh images and it already can uh to a strikingly scary accuracy of the real world that people find hard to tell the difference between and that's just in its infancy i can only imagine what's going to come out of the next handful of years and how quickly people will jump on to, so I saw that video of so-and-so saying this or doing that. Like, yeah, that wasn't real. Well, yeah, it was. And all you get, all it takes is one person, especially in politics, to go, that's interesting. But why yeah. are, are you denying that that's, that, are you saying that that's not real? No, that's just interesting. You'll have people who will play to that, even if they know something is not accurate, and just go, hmm, you know? Uh, it, it's, it, some, it's it's almost like uh, Trump not denouncing um, the Klan, endorsing him. <laughs> like, right? it, you know, it's like like they just kind of. Well, I, I'm not a part of that, but do you denounce them? I'm not a part of it. You know, it's that, and I'm not trying to pick on Trump or Trump. Follow. I'm just using that as an example where presented with something that you know is completely fucking wrong, yeah. but but you don't want to completely say no to it because. In reality, you're going to turn off thousands of people who think in a real fucked up way, but who also support you. And and then when you have AI type stuff coming in there to confuse the shit out of everyone, uh, it's it's going to get messy, far more messy than it is if you can imagine that. But anyway, let's uh, talk more about the Koberger case uh, in response uh, to the state's petition. Uh, The defense has outlined their perception of the holes in the case with the DNA conundrum being the first to be pointed out. Um, The presence of multiple DNA samples from different men at the crime scene should potentially account for the six weeks it took to apprehend Koberger. During this time, many potential suspects were under investigation, their DNA samples collected, and their personal belongings examined for potential evidence. Moreover, the defense makes a startling claim. Despite the ongoing investigations and DNA examinations, there was a total absence of DNA evidence linking the victims to Koberger's apartment, office, home, or vehicle. An allegation casts a shadow over the prosecution's claim and raises significant questions. I question that statement right there, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. That seems like a little bit of grandstanding because there was a lot of things taken from that home. And you know what? They don't have to reveal everything they found right now. They don't have no, to say don't. that the blood-like stains they found on a pillow uh, belong to someone. They don't have to say anything more about the ID cards that they found in Koberger's glove boxes other than, hey, it correlates to that home. Because who has just <laughs> ID cards of random people in their glove box, especially the home that you're accused of murdering people in that you have nothing to do with? That just seems a little bit odd. Um there's a lot here, and and they can say they don't have this. They don't know that. They don't do, say whatever they want in grandstand, but there's going to be so many things that come out into this trial that we did not know about earlier that I, I think will really bring a lot of doubt to light and, and I, I think really 
shine the light on where this is is truly going and who's truly at fault here. At the same point, the um, the defense of Koberger could have some things too. They claim that they have that exonerating evidence. One would assume they would bring that out right now to exonerate him and end this, uh, but maybe it's not quite as not uh, questionable as they like to make it sound. Another uncertainty and potential hole in the case is the identification of the suspect's car. Now, again, they used her big hole in the case. That's what they're trying to do. Punch holes in this. I, I don't know how this is that questionable of one, but a lot of times it comes, this is really kind of coming down to the year of the car that they're, they're arguing, if you will. The probable cause affidavit vaguely mentions a white sedan, but fails to disclose the maker model Lawson reveals that only one sighting in the vehicle could definitively link it to a Hyundai Elantra, the model driven and owned by Koberger. The uncertainty over how the police concluded that the car was an Elantra adds to the growing list of questions. Questions that will be answered in the trial, keep in mind. So they can throw all these questions out there right now because, again, they are trying to, and if you're a defense attorney, this is what you should be doing. They're vigorously trying to defend their client uh, and find any place that you can sow doubt where it may be. But maybe is is very much what it is. An FBI report dated March 21st, 2023, heavily relied on video footage of a car moving in the wrong direction and at the wrong time on Ridge Road. However, the details of this connection remain shrouded in ambiguity. Uh, amid all these doubts, as Koberger delays uh, pro pro providing an alibi, the prosecution also appears to be dragging their feet when it comes to establishing a clear motive as well, uh, adding more ambiguity, ambu ambu I can never say this word. Ambiguity. Ambiguity. There we there go. You go. Ambiguity. I always miss a syllable that I'm like, ah, to the proceedings. Logston points out that uh, as of his filing the objection, prosecutors have failed to present any evidence uh, of connection between Koberger and the victims. So they're literally like saying they're, the prosecution hasn't provided anything. Along, oh, wait a minute. And, and listen to all his, this. Wasn't his phone pinging yes. to the area as well? There's a thousand things they've connected to him and the victims. That, yeah. That's just a flat out BS line. Uh, that That is just simply trying to tell people who are uninformed. Well, I heard there was not much of a connection there because that's okay, all they but, heard was that story. That one right there. Right. So let's let's fast forward to a different time when he was back home and his family members said that he was wearing gloves. Yeah. And putting his trash I mean, in baggies. So there's a huge laundry list of things that that are suspicious and do connect him to the crime. Number one, the DNA on the knife sheath. There's a connection right there. Number two, the roommate did see someone looking uh Matching Koberger's description as best you can when you're wearing uh, a hooded uh, uh, over your face hoodie uh, a mask, but very much matching the height. And they also said eyebrows. Uh, people are like, well, how do you see eyebrows through a hoodie? It depends how big your eye holes are cut, quite honestly. Sometimes you can. Uh, yeah. There's also uh, the car, which they were looking for. And I'm sure it will be explained why and how they're looking for that very specific vehicle. Uh, mainly because it was found on cameras around that area, uh, as well as the phone. His phone pinged him around the house for a long time leading up to this event. Then it pings showing him going to that direction, uh, then it's mysteriously turning off during the murder time, and then mysteriously hmm. coming back on, driving out of the city, going back to his place of residence. Uh, the list does go on. But there is quite a bit that does uh, connect him to this. So saying there's nothing uh, is really being not truthful. Uh, I, I would say anyway. It's just I there's there's just they're grasping at straws. It's this one thing that they could say. Well, we don't know that it was an Elantra, but we do know very many details about the car that it looks very much like his car we know that it drove by several times at a weird time um his phone pinged in the area his dna was found there he was acting strange at his home he's got you know little tokens that he kept i mean there's just yeah he was I, taking... I don't know how he didn't do it exactly i mean these are the actions are not those of a normal human being uh just visiting the parents going and putting your trash 
in the neighbor's trash bin. Uh, there's a lot. There is quite a bit. What we're viewing, viewing here right now is essentially a political campaign. It is a political campaign to all of Moscow, Idaho, and potential jurors. And that now includes everybody who gets to hear it, who are making their judgments back at home. But the main thing is you're campaigning in that market uh, for believing another narrative to the story. And as we know in political campaigns, how many times do we hear complete bogus lies uh, in in campaign videos and advertisements or stories that come out and someone says this because they're on that side and someone says this on the other side? The problem is, in this case, one side has a true set of facts. The others just seem to be trying to blow them up and say they're not true, even though they're factual. So we're arguing the facts of facts. Ugh. But I just I just it, it'll be so interesting to see this this trial get going because there's so much speculation and and so many things being leaked out that just it's astounding. It, it's so fascinating. It's going to be interesting. Uh, I, I do wonder if the attorneys for Koberger at this point are not necessarily trying to fight for uh, his freedom but most more so for his life uh, at this point and, and maybe trying to complicate this in such a way and make it extremely costly for the state. But at some point the state just says, let's, let's just try and give him a, a, a plea deal where we don't kill him, but he spends life in prison. Yeah, exactly. So all of this grandstanding and all that could be part of the strategy, him saying, not saying anything, uh, when asked to plead, I think also plays into that possibly being part of their strategy. I think they know they don't have a very strong case and they're going to have to try and poke a hole in anything and everything they possibly can and try and find things that were maybe not quite done by the book or maybe it was a rookie mistake or something like that Then try and argue that everything around that person or that action can't be considered, which is bullshit. Uh, but yeah. that's the kind of uh, strategy I feel like they're beginning to take. And I think it's going to be interesting if we're going to truly see a trial here come October. I think it could be delayed. I think it's very likely. Uh, or I could see some sort of a plea deal coming in where maybe there is a guilty plea uh, and there is the agreement that death will be taken off the table. Hard to tell in this one, but... Certainly one to uh, to keep a close eye on. Interesting looking at it from the other perspective here, but again, I'm not really seeing any of those arguments as being very strong. If you want to weigh in on this, uh, I'd love to hear your arguments. 888-554-5537. 888-5KILLER is our phone number to uh, give us your thoughts on the Koberger case or any of the cases we follow for you right here. You're locked into the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now. You're consuming the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.